huge welcome to um, this Horse Tribe webinar. Um, it's the second one that Simon Kokosa has done for us and we're delighted to have him back. Last time talking about core conditioning for horses was hugely popular and this time talking about um, kiss goodbye to kissing spine is even more popular still. So we, we're, we're not going to waste any more time with intros or any background. We're just going to hand straight over to Simon. We'll turn our cameras off, mute ourselves um, and join you back again for questions. So Simon, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Taya, Horse Fest, Horse Tribe. All very good stuff. Thanks for the introduction and welcome to everyone, wherever in the world you are. Um, okay, tonight, you're probably looking for answers. Um, I've been where you are. Um, if you've got a, a recent or an ongoing diagnosis of kissing spine with your horse, um, you probably have heard many different versions of how one can approach this uh, to help your horse. Um, this is just going to be another one, but my approach is um, a purely practical one as a trainer. So I use techniques that, as far as I'm concerned, work, and they work for me on a daily basis, and I, I hope they can help you find a direction to move forward into. Um, okay, so if we could start the slide, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with the obvious. I want to walk you through... Um, the pathology, what's going on inside the horse, the cause and the effect, and some of the things you might resonate with with your horse. Uh, you may see behavioral and physical changes. We're going to go through a few of them now, uh, just so you can identify what are your horse's intrinsic uh, qualities or personality and what may be coming from this particular issue. So, uh, as we all know, we sit right in the middle of the horse's back. Now, this is a very long spinal column, and so when we introduce weight in the center of the spinal column, mid-length, of course, it has an impact on the horse's body. If we could go to the next slide, please. So, although it's not a, a huge change, the introduction of weight in the middle of the back causes a slight dipping of the spine. Uh, if you look at the two pictures here, uh, the upper picture would be, say, the horse at rest, and the lower picture is representative of what would happen to the spinal column when we add our weight. Um, so we are, in effect, by riding the horse, altering the angle of the spinal column. This, of course, is not a good thing and has a lot of knock-on effects. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So just to give you a background of how the, the spinal column is uh, constructed, we have three main sections. So we have the cervical section, which is the neck. There are seven very big vertebrae. Now these vertebrae can uh, move in three dimensions. They can uh, round, they can uh, rotate, and they can laterally flex. Now the main section, the bit we're sitting on, the thoracic section, is uh, limited only to lateral flexion, which is why we run into so many problems when we put weight on them, because we actually cause them to dip, for which they are not designed. Uh, so this is why uh, the majority of the problems we see with horses' backs do come from the thoracic section. There are 18 vertebrae in this section, and each one has a rib. Uh, going towards the rear of the horse, we have the lumbar section of the spine, there are six vertebrae here. These are very, very strong structures, still very fragile when it comes to alignment. Um, and we often get uh, compressions here too, as a consequence of what's happening, happening in the thoracic section of the spine. Now the uh, lumbar area um, can rotate and round, but doesn't have any lateral ability. So the lateral ability comes from the thoracic section in particular. Okay, if we go on to the next slide. So when we place weight on this section of the horse's spine, it lowers and therefore compresses. As I said, it, it's not designed to hollow in a sort of lowering way. So um, when it does, the structures that are in place compress together 
Now, if we go on to the next slide, it shows this very well. So each of the uh, thoracic and lumbar vertebrae have a vertical spinal process. As you can see here, we have the wither around the T5 area. And then where we would normally sit at the back of the saddle uh, around the T16, T18 area. And if you look closely at this graphic, you can see that the processes have little sort of mushroom shaped heads at the top. These are very, very close, even in a horse that hasn't ever been ridden. So it doesn't take much of a dip for them to squeeze together. And this is the problem that we face. Um, next slide, please. So what happens um, when these processes touch because of a hollowing of the back is you get bone on bone contact. As you can see here from the, uh, the circled area, you have two uh, vertical processes and where there could, should be, could be a couple of millimeters between them, they come into contact. Obviously, this isn't gonna be very comfortable for the horse. So a lot of the things that we experience when we're dealing with a horse that has kissing spine are from the compression of bone on bone contact. Also important to remember that these structures are covered in a sensitive, um, uh, sensitive nerves. So when you do get a compression, it's very painful indeed. Um, next slide, please. Now, obviously, mechanically, as the spinal column is rather like a bicycle chain, if the links aren't aligned properly, not only do we get a contact point at the, uh, between the processes, as you can see on the picture on the right, uh, the top circle, we've got the processes touching, but also there's a lower circle to the right of it, which is um, showing a contact point between the articular processes. This can cause a lot of pain because there are even more nerves on the articular processes that are actually attached to the vertebra body than on the process heads. So when we see uh, a lot of discomfort in the horse, usually it's because we have a spondylosis problem and the, uh, the bones are not only touching on the process, but they're also touching at the base. This is something to bear in mind. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so here's an x-ray. I'm sure you're all familiar with this sort of thing. Um, here we see the very obvious friction points where the spinal processes have been forced together and you get changes in the bone surface. It lays down more calcium, more bones. Sometimes they even fuse, but often they just sort of knock against each other like hammers. This would be a case where that has happened, where you can see that there, there is repeated injury, repeated stress on the bone structures. There will be spondylosis also here because the spine has collapsed in this very specific area. Okay, and on to the next slide, please. The, so that would be the mechanical, that would be the hardware, the skeleton. And so if we move on to the software, the muscle tissue, um, there are two muscles in the back that are worth mentioning and are worth paying attention to. And that is the longissimus dorsi uh, muscles. These are very big and they run the whole length of the horse's back either side of the spine. These are the muscles that we sit on, and they're also the muscles that react to defend the horse against pain in the back, which is very, very important because if we're looking at how horses move, if there is a, a tension or even a spasm in either of these muscles, it will alter the way the horse moves. So if we move on to the next slide, so if you get a shortening of the longissimus dorsi muscle, let's say on the left-hand side, it shortens the whole left-hand side of the horse and drags the spinal column out of alignment. Now, when the spinal column is out of alignment and also hollow, it ceases to function. The horse is going to be noticeably um, unable to turn one way in comparison to the other because it, they can turn into the tension, but they can't turn away from the tension because they can't extend the outside of the body. And um, if we watch them, they tend to move in a rather odd way, shuffling with their limbs and not using their torso, which of course they can and should. 
So when we see a horse that is misaligned, it's because of the large muscles in the back that have gone into a very defensive state. Next slide, please. So as well as the lateral lack of straightness, when the horse's back is dipped and the longissimus muscles have gone into a defensive uh, mode, it will raise the head, raise the quarters and hollow the back. And that will open the baseline so the horse loses his ability to sit. Uh, the energy gets thrust forward because the hocks are pitched too far out the back as the pelvis is rotated forwards too much because the back is too low. It's a syndrome. And if we go on to the next slide, please. Sorry, Simon, just to interrupt, I've got a couple of people messaging, sorry, um, guys, saying that they've still got problems with an echo, which I can't hear. Um, could somebody bob in the chat if they've still got an echo going on? No problem here, no problem. Okay. All right, so it might be isolated to a couple of people all right brilliant sorry i will i'll turn myself off i just wanted to check that it wasn't something that was affecting everybody so thanks guys for letting us know and sorry if you have i'm not sure what's happening but i will let simon continue thanks simon that's okay that's, I, uh, anyone who can hear me twice my apologies once is probably enough okay so when we do have a blockage through tension in the horse's back we lose the ability to bend. Here's a good graphic. So of course you've got the horse on the left that can give us a free uniform bend throughout the spinal column. This horse will go around the corner very smoothly, be very easy to ride turns with. The horse on the right, on the other hand, without the use of the thoracic flexion, the, any energy produced by the back end gets thrust forward and goes out of the outside shoulder and there is nothing you can do about it. In fact, there's nothing the horse can do about it. So um, the tension in the longissimus dorsi is one of the biggest signs that we have a problem in the back and problem in the spine that we need to cure. And this is something that is very common. I mean, I'm sure we've all ridden the majority of horses that fall out of the outside shoulder on one rein or the other. This will be why. Next slide, please. Uh, another, another aspect to look at when you're looking at your horse and you're assessing which parts of the body are working and aren't working is muscle distribution. Now, um, so we have an image of a horse with a grid. If we look at the low line muscles, the shoulder muscles and the, uh, the muscles in the hindquarters, all the, the muscles that are below the spine are used for dragging or pushing. So the front end will drag the horse forward and the back end will push the horse forward. If your horse or uh, any horse has a, um, a lack of musculature in the top line, it's because the lifting muscles, the ones that control spinal angle, are weak or atrophied or just inactive. So the horse's body will show you which parts are working and which parts aren't depending on the muscle mass. Very interesting and very important because of course we can diagnose how we approach each individual to work correctly by seeing where they are weak and where they are strong. It's as simple as that. Uh, next slide, please. Another sign that we have a, a, a back that isn't performing properly is of course the horse loses its ability to shift its weight towards the rear. So if we have a look at this image, we see this horse cantering along. He can't get rid of the load on the front end because the back end cannot sit and lower. So the horse is always trying to chase and break over with the front legs to meet the forward movement. Now, the, the thing is when a horse loses its ability to round the back and take the weight behind, what is happening is they fall forward. So you may feel the sensation that the horse is running. They're not running deliberately, they're falling. So this uh, horse, for example, if you look at the, uh, the front left uh, leg, it's taking all the weight has to roll almost completely over the top before it can break away because the back end is in the air. This is something we see a lot. If you go on to the next slide, please. 
And without the ability to flex the spine laterally, the horse has to fall to the inside to turn. Again, something we see a lot of. Ideally, when the horse is flexible in the back, they will bend through the thorax and not fall one way or the other, even in a turn. So they remain balanced with 25% of their weight on each foot um, and very easy to ride. They ride around the corner like they're on tracks. This horse obviously is leaning in so he can compensate for the fact that his back won't bend. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, something also that you will have seen very common is triangulation. Now, again, when the horse has one side or the other side in a blockage, and it usually is the dominant side of the back that is blocked. So if they're a right-hander the, um, to defend the back, the longissimus dorsi on the right will lock up before the one on the left. And what this does is this, as it drags the quarters to one side, you get a triangulation and a crookedness. Again, when you're riding this horse, as this horse is approaching the corner, it'll be very, very difficult to turn the shoulders out of the way because the shoulders are preloaded, not only from the fact that the weight is being thrown forwards by the fact that they're rounding the back, but also the quarters are far too far to the inside. So the energy gets pushed to the outside shoulder, the, uh, the, the right four in this case. Again, a very familiar feeling, most horses do this. So we have to bear in mind that when we're dealing with a horse that's got a bad back, we are going to be dealing with asymmetry. One side of the body is gonna be very different from the other side, so the two reins are gonna feel very, very different to work with. Um, next slide, please. Another little sign which you may be familiar with is the horse either can't lift one hind leg as high as the other one when you pick the feet out, or when it's really bad, sometimes they try and pull the foot out of your hand. People think that it's a behavioral issue and the horse is being naughty. No, what it is, as we know when we have a bad back, is that when you stand on one leg that makes the muscle or the area that, that's giving you pain take the weight, you've got to put the other foot down. Uh, so if you have a discrepancy between the horse's ability to lift the leg uh, when you're picking, the horse, picking their feet out behind, you know there's something not quite right in the back because there may be pain. And I think we have to sort of accept that if the horse is finding it difficult to stand on one hind leg, standing still, we can imagine what that must feel like if they're in motion. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a video um, of a horse with kissing spine and it's a mare and she's showing a collection of typical traits. She's got a windmill tail. The head and neck are no longer really attached to the torso. So the rider in an attempt to uh, stay in control of the horse just curls the front end up. So there is no fluid energy transfer from the back to the front. Also, you can notice the horse is lifting up behind and um, becoming disunited in the canter because it's str struggling to find a way of cantering, a way of moving which doesn't hurt, which of course it can't because there's a mechanical interference going on in the back. But of course, the horse doesn't realize this. They're just trying to get through the day. So this is quite a severe case, but then it's a mare, so it's being quite expressive. Sometimes I find that geldings have a higher pain threshold, complain a bit less, but that doesn't mean they're suffering any less. Okay, and on to the next slide, please. So once we get beyond that stage, when the horse really is in uh, acute pain, pain drives people and animals crazy. And so we can get to a point where, although they may be showing behavioral issues, they are really just saying enough is enough. And um, this happens usually after a number of years because it's being a degenerative syndrome, it won't get better on its own. It just tends to either stabilize or get worse. And some horses just have too much and say no. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to realize at this point that that we, we obviously very much care for our horses, 
And if there is bone to bone contact that is causing acute pain, we have to forgive them for expressing themselves in a negative or uncooperative way. Um, they need our help and they need our empathy. And uh, that really is, if anything, the main focus of horse ownership. So please forgive them for what they do. Um, the good news is, next slide, please, that if you can fix the problem, you will get the athlete that you want. Because when the horse's body works well and is pain free, they're more than happy to do whatever we want, all the stupid things and endless circles and going sideways, they're happy to do it. Um, and it's not impossible. We are currently have a 100% success rate in reversing kissing spine. It's just about doing the right work in the right way. So you're not alone. There is a way and stick around for part two and I'll show you how I approach this problem. Thank you, Simon. Um, so as Simon said, that's we've got to the end of part one, which is really around this, the symptoms and how horses present themselves. So if anybody's got questions now, if we could concentrate the questions on that part, we're going to come to the approach that you take and the training that you do next. And then we'll have another section for questions um, at the end of that. So um, please do type away um, your questions and um, we will start to answer those, ask those of Simon as we go. Uh, we did have some by email, Simon, so I'm just going to double check and see if we have any that link to diagnosis. I don't think they are, but more rehab. So, um, yeah, they're more, yeah, they're more in the rehab territory. So it's, here we go. We've got some questions coming in now. So um, Rachel says, does, uh, why does the literature say that so many diagnosis, diagnosed cases don't have clinical signs? Well, it all depends what you mean by clinical signs, because I think that they, horses, they don't, they hide the pain, but they don't hide the lack of motility. And that's why muscle distribution is such an important element here. You know, if we see the way horses move, um, although they may not be showing, you know, all those classical, very expressive signs of pain, they may be in long-term chronic pain, but they're just being very stoic. Some have a higher pain threshold than others. Also, it depends where the contact points are. I think sometimes you can have bone on bone contact from a, a, a dorsal spinal process hitting its neighbor, but it just fortunately misses a nerve. And if it misses the nerve, the horse seems to be able to accept this and carry on working. In fact, most horses that work at a high level do have some form of kissing spine, I think 96%. Um, so most of them cope, um, and it's only the smaller aspects, the sort of, uh, again, muscle distribution and way of going that show this, and this is why. Obviously, if you get um, an impingement in the uh, articular process, they seem to explode. So um, I think it depends on the location of the nerves and the location of the bone-on-bone -bone contact. Of course, it's different every time. Thank you, Simon. We've got a couple of questions that are similar. Um, so I'll, I'll ask them both together and you can answer them as one, hopefully. Um, if a horse has close spinous processes and they fuse, can you see it externally? That's one. And then the other one is, can you tell if there's kissing spine by palpation? So both of those same, basically, can you, mm. can you tell without an x-ray, I'm guessing? Well, it, it depends because if you get... Um the new bone being laid down on those sort of mushroomy heads, then you can feel it. Yeah, you know, if you run your fingers down this horse's spine, you can feel the heads of the processes and where there's bone laid down and they're fused, you can often feel it, it's sort of, there's a slight dip, but it doesn't dip as far down as it would if they were separate. So I think that you probably can feel it if it's at the top of the, the, the mushroom, it's um, midway down or at the base. No, you won't feel it, it's too deep. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, do, 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 do that one. Um, my horse has a lump on his spine, but none of the other obvious symptoms. But the work in yoga for horses has helped him enormously. Could it be old? Uh, could it be old and cold, and I have to stretch around it? So not okay, sure. That's a that's a good question. Um, it depends how he's working. If he's happy to work and he's improving, then you're probably moving in the, the right direction. If you find you get to a point of training or, uh, or you find that there are sort of learning blockages where the horse won't try anymore, then it, it's probably worth just having a spinal x-ray just so you can see what's going on. And then you know, and then we can talk about what one would do to help that specific area because it's all about location different movements different exercises affect the spine in different places because of course the spine has different properties throughout its length um so you really you, you, my first suggestion with anyone who wants to know what's going on with their horse's back to even to eliminate the spine as the cause of training issues is have an x-ray and then you'll know you know what to do and where it is. Thank you. Um, just another one from Claire. So can you discuss how the neck at one end and the SI straight pelvis at the other end are affected by kissing spine? Sorry, could you repeat that? Can you discuss how the neck at one end and the SI straight pelvis at the other end are affected by kissing spine? So I'm guessing saying, is there any difference or what might you see or... Would you, would you notice it in the same way, I guess, because we've talked about it being under the saddle particularly, haven't we? Yeah. Um, the, there is a location at the base of the neck where the C7, T1 junction is. Obviously, the thoracic section is pretty fixed. It's quite rod-like, certainly on a vertical plane, where uh, the T1 and C7, the lowest of the neck vertebrae, that's a very mobile joint. And if we raise the horse's head, we can make a contact point there. I think it's actually quite common. And horses that become resistant when the head is uh, picked up, often there's a contact point there. That of course would be a symptom of a weak core. Also because the thoracic section is too low. So when we bring the head up, we create this contact point at the top. In fact, in the next section, I've got a good um, anatomical image of that. So look out for it, the base of the neck. Um, really, I feel that you can get problems all along the spinal column and how the horse reacts, what it's doing to avoid pain or manage pain is different depending on the location. Now, when it comes to the, the sacroiliac joint, if there is a loss of mobility along the spinal column, the, uh, the SI, which is an immovable joint, it's not really meant to take any movement, um, has to move more. And that's when it starts to get aggravated and inflamed. So SI problems usually come as an end result of a, um, a locking up of the spinal column by the longissimus dorsi muscles to prevent the uh, processes from rubbing. But no, again, the only way to determine what to do about an, an individual horse's issues is to have a full spinal x-ray and then you can see where you are. So yeah, location specific, but then also so is the therapy location specific. Right. I hope that answered the question, I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's one here that's kind of linked to sort of asking a little bit about confirmation. Shall we, that's from Tracy, should we hold that one for the next section if you're going to, are you, because you're going to show the diagram? It's does confirmation affect kissing spine, e.g. croup high, spine, set neck, short neck, long back, etc. Will you cover no, that? No, let's go for that now. Yeah, because of course that's, that's, that's one of those questions which is about the specific type of build. So yeah. yeah, sure, I'd love to hear it. So does, does confirmation affect kissing spine, e.g. croup high, high set neck, short neck, long back, etc.? Yes, yes, it does. 
Um, although, I've seen horses with excellent x-rays and terrible confirmation, and I've seen horses with excellent confirmation and awful x-rays. So I would say that proportionally, it's more about management and training, maybe 75, 80%, and 20% about confirmation. Mm -hmm. I'm always surprised when I see horses that aren't very well built, that are working very, very well. Uh, so, so it's, I would say work with what you've got, solve the problems, and you might be surprised that what is presented as being less than ideal, short neck, croup high, hollow back, can be retrained in something that works for that individual. Because of course, it's important to, to define the difference between confirmation and posture. Obviously confirmation is what it is, and we can't change it, but posture, we can. So, of course, the trick is to release the entire system, strengthen the entire system and balance it so that even if there are, you know, less than classical conformational properties, the horse will find a way of making it work if everything's working properly. So I think that possibly answers Helen's question. Um, is kissing spines, in your view, genetic or as a result of how we work horses now? And you've just done a kind of a 75-25 there. That sort of part, that touches on her, her point, I guess, doesn't it? Yeah, that's interesting because there are, I, I, you know, I have read the odd um, report that some horses that are unbacked have kissing spine. So I would say that because there are millimetres between these processes naturally, Sure, some of them are going to have poor posture naturally, and so they're going to have kissing spine even without the weight of a rider. Is it genetic? Well, I suppose from the consideration that, they, that the horse's genes and evolution put the processes very, very close. So from that perspective, there are going to be horses that the processes are closer than others, but it really doesn't make any difference because... If we get a, a lowering of the, the back, because the core muscles are not strong enough to keep the, the, the spine in, uh, optimally aligned, they will get kissing spine. Whether they've got a genetic predisp predisposition or not, it's irrelevant because it's a flexible organism. Um, so I tend not to go down the genetic route until we're retraining the horse's posture because only then will we be able to determine whether or not they've got a problem that we can't solve or a problem that just needs to uh to be retrained and as yet i haven't found anything uh i haven't come across one that cannot be solved by retraining so i wouldn't take the the genetic uh, yeah. aspect too too seriously and also i read the report i think it was a swedish study and they looked at sort of 10 horses and it's just not enough. And most of them were thoroughbreds. And of course, thoroughbreds, if they've been on the track are backed very young, so they've got more of a tendency to have kissing spine, but is that because it's genetic or the fact that they were ridden when they were very young and very weak? Difficult to say. I think the studies really haven't been extensive enough to determine that question. Thank you so much. Um, another one linked to, to diagnosis and symptoms and so on. So, um, hi Simon, would it be typical for a kissing spine horse to canter easing, easily and willingly on straight lines and large out arcs out hacking, collected, extended, flying changes on arcs, whatever is asked, but struggle in the arena on circles due to lateral flexion needed for the circle and probably relevant to the next part, will canter in comfort, e.g. Hacking, um, hacking to help build uh, back muscles and improve function. So, so the, that was the question was, and will canter um, oh, yeah, um, increase it? In, increase. Do you know, I think that the thing is, if you've got an impingement somewhere, what happens is, it, it, there, there are degrees. I think, you know, we, we actually probably need to talk about a scale of, 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 of impingement on, along the horse's spine. But if it's a light impingement, what happens is there are only certain angles that hurt. So yes, 
you know, if you're on a hack and you're having a canter and you're not trying to create bend and the horse can triangulate and bring the quarters to one side, they can probably find, if it's not severe, that horse can probably find a way of going which limits the pitch just simply by avoidance. But then this very horse, if you put it in a particular angle and ask him to do something that makes that contact point compress, then he'll complain about it. Um, but I wouldn't say um, that hacking in itself would change this because horses being as they are, they have um, incredible ability to compensate and work around a physical problem. It's one of their strengths. Um, so if you have a back issue of any kind, even if you allow the horse to just essentially train itself on a hack, um, you won't get to the bottom of it. The horse will just work around it. Thank you. Great okay. stuff. We have more questions, but I think we need to crack on with the second half and then we'll do our best to get through as many as at the end of, of that, that part as well, if that's okay. Terrific. Okay, and let's get cracking. Oh, could I just quickly remind everyone, we've got some fab questions coming through on chat. If you don't mind putting them in on the Q&A element, it's easier for us to tick off when they've been answered. So it should just be next to your chat function. So have a look there and type them in there. Thanks, guys. We'll disappear now. Great. You, hopefully your slides are back on there. There we go. Uh, there's the front slide. Okay, if we could slide, that's terrific. Okay, so as we just talked about, confirmation we can't change, posture we can. So what is posture? Posture is the, let's say optimal posture is the optimal alignment of the skeleton. If the skeleton is optimally aligned, then all the joints that join the individual bones together can run straight and true. If the skeleton is not correctly aligned, you will get contact points, i.e. kissing spine. You will get soft tissue uh, problems, joint problems, because somewhere along the line, if there's a, a misalignment in the back, you will get misalignments going all the way down through the limbs and they will start to complain at some point. So rearranging the horse's skeletal posture is the key. It's the entry point, it's, it's the solution. How do we affect the horse's skeletal posture? Well, the bones are put in the right place and held in place and move in the right direction by the core muscles, the muscles that are in the torso. Now these are quite difficult to access. Just running around doesn't do it. They play very specific roles. They're in very specific places and um, we have to isolate them in our work. So I wanted to show you essentially the plan that we use to re-educate the horse's posture, both skeletally and from the muscular aspect. So we've got the hardware and the software and we have to take care of them together. So if we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so in this graphic, we can see, it's a really good graphic, I like this one. So as we hollow the back, it has a mechanical effect on the skeleton of pushing the pelvis forward. So the hind legs, could you play, press play again there, Heidi? No, go back, that's it, yeah. Lovely. So if the back hollows, it pushes the head up and also the pelvis changes its angle. So as the pelvis changes its angle, the hind legs can no longer come forward enough to take the weight of the torso. They stick out the back and this throws all the moving weight forward onto the front legs. So if we see horses lifting the head and, um, having a back end which never seems to engage, this is the reason. It's all coming from that specific area that we're sitting on. Next slide, please. So the colored arrows show you the, the network of the core muscles as they're in the core. So you've got that they, they pretty much envelop 
the soft tissue of the torso. These are the muscles that alter the angles of interaction of all the different elements of the skeleton. So this is where our work is. And specifically, next slide, please. Specifically, we're dealing with the abdominal muscle group. As you can see here in red, we have the intercostals in green. So their condition is, is, is vital. If you um, have a horse that has a slightly large belly, it can sometimes appear to be fat. But if you, if you look at the rest of the body, usually they're not fat at all. It's just a distension of the abdominal wall. So if you, um, the, the shortening of the abdominal uh, muscle group is one of the aspects that ties the torso together and pushes the spine up again. So when the abdominal wall distends and the belly gets bigger, the apparatus that keeps the spine up and flat and optimal is gone. So the back drops. So often the back drops first and then the belly stretches out afterwards. So the abdominal muscles are absolutely crucial. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the iliopsoas. This is the muscle that controls the angle of the pelvis in relation to the rest of the spine. The horse can move around and not use this muscle at all by just using the large superficial muscles on the outside of the body. But this is the one that alters the, 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 the angle of the pelvis and therefore the overall ability of the horse to sit down and balance themselves front to back. So the iliopsoas is another very, very important muscle group. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the multifidus. Now the multifidus is a muscle, if we research it, it, it's quite odd that we know about it, we know what it does, but we don't really know how it interacts with the rest of the body. I'm certainly still learning about it. What I do know is it runs the length of the spine, it's right underneath the spine, and apparently it has the same volume of nerve endings coming out of it as the, sp as the spinal cord. So this is a, a, a muscle which I think is a control muscle, more like, uh, like the CPU or the brain of the body as it distributes information about posture from the spinal cord, obviously that's come from the brain, to a sort of feedback of nerves that goes throughout the body. So the multifidus is a extraordinary piece of equipment and has to be in excellent condition, otherwise the horse really cannot control their own body properly. Okay, next slide, please. So, from a mechanical point of view, the top picture, we have a horse whose spine is optimally arranged, so they'll have full flexibility, full range of motion throughout the spinal column. Lower picture, compromised, there's compression, and the forces are flying off in different directions. So we've got a lifting of the scapula and the uh, pelvis is coming upwards in the air too and that's compressing all that energy into the processes and pushing them together. As you can imagine, very uncomfortable for the horse. Next slide, please. So we saw this picture earlier. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to restore the original spacing or maximize the spacing between the processes. Worth looking at because when you look at your x-rays, you can compare them to this um, and it gives you a much clearer idea of where your horse's problem is, how severe it is. So that tells us what to do about it um, from a medication point of view and also uh, how to solve it biomechanically. Next slide, please. So, how do we decompress the spinal column? Right, the, the best way is to put, to um, fully release the top line. So we train the horse to lower the head. And I'll show you how we're gonna do that in a few slides. But essentially, when we lower the head and neck, it has a lifting effect on the rest of the back. And this is exactly the kind of action we need. We need the spine to be pushed upwards from within the core, 
But by act to access that, for example, if you have a horse that has learnt to, to move without using the core muscles and they're atrophied or very, very weak, or the horse is in pain, then we need something mechanical to kickstart the action. And lowering the head and teaching the horse to work lower and lower and lower is the way of lifting the spine and resetting the distances between the processes. Next slide, please. Now, why is lowering the head useful? Um, the neutral ligament is a rope-like ligament which runs from the uh, ears to the tail. So it runs across the whole top line. This neutral ligament is attached to the cervical vertebrae. So that means that the lower the horse's head becomes, when the, the, the nose gets to around chest level and below, the neutral ligament, which has these laminae, as you can see in red here, attached to the, uh, the, the vertebra, they tense up and start to pull upwards. So when we get the horse to the point where the head is low enough, it will actually lift the spine between the shoulder blades. This is an absolutely crucial element in a rehab of a, of a horse that has kissing spine because it's mechanically lifting the spine and splaying the processes for us. So we don't really have to do anything. We just have to show the horse where it is. And once they start to stretch, they start to realize that this is more comfortable thanks to the new channel ligament. Uh, next slide, please. So as the new channel ligament pulls upwards on the vertebrae, it starts to lift the thoracic sling. So as you can see from this graphic, the shoulder blades are only attached to the horse's torso by muscle. They don't have a clavicle like we do. So we get this green arrow effect of the torso being lifted as the head lowers. This of course starts to reset not only the spinal column that we're sitting on, but it starts to correct all the other little problems that have come along um, in this uh, sort of degenerative cycle, like the pelvic angle. So it, working long and low, and then working into forward down and out, where the horse is in a grazing position, is a pivotal part of the rehabilitation process. Next slide, please. So there, there have been questions about working a horse forward or down and out posture. The reason it works is not only to do with the neutral ligament, as I showed you a, a second ago, but nature took care of this a long time ago. The horse's body is designed to be able to stand up, be in balance and graze for 18 hours a day. They, they, they have to do this to sustain such a large body on what is not very nutritious food, which is grass. So they have to eat a lot of it. So they have to spend a lot of time grazing. Evolution has sorted this out because obviously while the horse is eating, they're in a vulnerable position to predators. Not anymore, certainly not in Wiltshire, but historically. So uh, the neutral ligament is there. So the body, the central mass is in balance even when the horse has, has its nose in the grass, enabling it to flee if a predator comes because, you know, split seconds count. So working a horse forward, down and out in a grazing position is in fact natural. Okay, next slide, please. So this is, a, this is the, the, the picture I was talking about earlier when we were dealing with the question. So this is the base of the horse's neck. So you've got C7 and T1. So obviously the neck being very, very flexible, being able to stick it up in the air and drop it all the way down to eat grass, um, has a large range of motion at this coupling area. So where C7 meets T1, you get a lot of movement from C7 and virtually no movement from T1. So if you, the horse is pitched downwards, let's say the, the, the longissimus muscles are very, very tense and the horse cannot round the back or it's dipped because we have a kissing spine situation, then the angle of C7, um, if we bring the head and neck up to what would be a normal dressage position, you get a contact point at the top of that junction. This is very uncomfortable for the horse. So um, if we have a horse that will work in a softer, long and low outline, but as soon as you put them in a dressage outline, you have um, 
contact issues and discomfort. This is, this is an area uh, where that's likely to, to, to emanate from. Something to bear in mind. Now, obviously, working within the conformational restraints of the horse, we can alter the angle of the T1 C7 junction by improving the posture of the torso. If we do that, then we uh, just a few degrees alteration of the T1 vertebrae, vertebra will allow the C7 to come up without touching. And that's obviously what, 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 we, uh, what we have to aim for. So that is a, a location to bear in mind if you have contact issues in a dressage outline. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, my favorite exercise to begin with. It's called the Jira Volta lunge. I'll show you a video of that in a minute. It's uh, the yoga revolved triangle. So what we have is we uh, are trying to uh, fully extend the spine and put traction on the outside of the body, hence the twist. And this gives the horse the opportunity to uh, alter its posture by lowering the head, activating the neutral ligament and lifting the, uh, the torso in the thoracic sling. It is where the rehabilitation begins um, because it allows the horse time to accept the exercise and make their own modifications in their own time. Because of course it is their body and they have to work out how to change their own posture for the good. Uh, they, there's nothing we can do to explain it to them. So yoga revolve triangle and Jira Volta lunge is my go-to exercise for rehabilitation. I'll explain what that is. Um, next slide, please. So by creating the ideal angles in the horse's spine on the lunge, we can achieve a lifting of the wither, a rounding of the back. Obviously the thoracic section isn't the section of the spine isn't meant to round and it's not meant to hollow but if it is hollow we do need to round it so uh, by isolating this area we can lift that area and therefore realign the spine so it's no longer dipped and uh, therefore spread the processes out removing the contact points and alleviating the cause of pain and obviously by doing that we also realign the, the uh, pelvis by rotating it in this direction and the horse can then lay down weight behind sit and rebalance their body front to back so that's the effect we're after in the first instance next slide please so this isn't new this is a picture from i think it's 1939 german equestrian training manual uh, so this is uh, obviously um, understanding that we need to decompress the top line and we've always known that that's necessary um, and the effect it has. So the nose is going down to the ground and the inside hind can therefore come forward because the top line is free. So the baseline can then shorten and we get a horse with a rounder back in better balance. So again, this is not new. This is, these, these waters have been swum before. Next slide, please. Now, so on the lunge, I use a, a six meter down to circle. So that's uh, 21 foot. So about three meters between you and the horse. And the trick is to create um, an inside flexion. Um, I, I like to think of it as shoulder in while you're on the circle. This is the optimal flexion for aligning the spine so it can release. Because just by exercising the horse, if they're triangulating, the spine is too crooked to release. The horse doesn't know what perfect alignment is they're simply trying to struggle and get through the day the best they can so by lunging them on a rather small circle very slowly so it's, there's not an impact on the limb uh, in a shoulder in um, ang body angle it optimizes the distances between the bones specifically between the vertebra and the horse is able to feel this alignment and release and stretch and decompress the top line. And it happens all on its own. So this is the correct alignment to allow the horse to discover that. Next slide, please. So uh, the picture on the left, if the horse was just uh, trotting around on the lunge, 
um, the head will be up or even pitched to the outside, quarters coming in. So by bringing the head and neck to the inside, seeking this shoulder in angle, maybe a sort of 30 to 40 degree angle in the head and neck with a flexion. In the picture on the right, you can see as soon as it lines up, the horse can stretch forward and drop the head forward, down and out. It happens on its own. So they will take up the opportunity to decompress these structures if we can show them how to align to do it. And of course, once they can feel it, they seek it again. They want to self-soothe because they understand that if they achieve this position, they're more comfortable. And also what happens is that they learn that this is a better posture for them and then they adopt it as habit so we don't need to anymore. And this is the road to recovery, to relearning uh, posture, better posture. Okay, I think we have a video of that next. Okay, is that smooth for you guys? It's jittery here. Okay, let, let's assume it, it looks fine from the viewer's point. It's not smooth, yeah, yeah. That's a little bit jittery. This is quite an important video. Uh, could we try and fix this? We can also send, um, perhaps try and send it, Heidi when we send the recording. Yeah, we'll send the video separately as well. I think it's probably down to bandwidth, unfortunately. It's smooth when I'm watching it, playing it here. So it must be the joys of going through the internet. Okay. So essentially this is a video of, of one of my horses doing the Jura Volta very nicely in the trot. So we have the forward down and out where the nose is in a, in a grazing position. And it, it, if you can see, oh, good. Um, if it's smooth for you, you'll be able to see in the video that the, the torso has a very unique balance to it where every part of the body is moving, but no part is moving in a way that sticks out as compensating for a part that isn't moving. Yeah, jittery. Or maybe we could come back to that at the end to see if we can get it smooth for people because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very visual and it might be very good for people to see that working. Oh, it's getting better. Okay, so here's... Top line is released, there, there's nothing um, shortening the longissimus, otherwise he wouldn't be able to work down there. But as a result of working down there and the effect of the new channel ligament lifting the thorax, he's in perfect balance. The back end can work properly because it's free to do so. The front end can get out of the way because it isn't preloaded uh, by weight or misalignment. And as you can see, as he comes around the corner, all the limbs are in perfect alignment. We're, and the thing to remember about limbs is that if the torso is crooked, the limbs will have to work at a slight offset angle. Now, when limbs work at an offset angle, they don't like it because if you look at the way a horse's limb is constructed, it's only really meant to work when it's perfectly straight. If you get a rotational aspect to the way it lands, it will really start to hurt the joint on a long-term basis, which is why sorting a horse's posture out, whether the horse has a kissing spine or not, is crucial for the longevity of the limb structures over the long-term. That's a good idea, Chris. Should we come back to that one? Great, <laughs> okay. All right, so this horse is in trot um, and has a fully released spine. We started working this horse when he was four uh, during backing, so um, he never had uh, the opportunity, or lack of opportunity to, uh, to become tense in the back. So it's a very simple uh, training process to teach him to uh, be completely decompressed through the spine 
and uh, relax and lift through the, the torso. And this horse is obviously wonderful to ride as a result because when the horse's back is perfectly aligned to ride, it's a very, very smooth process um, because there are no edges to the movement. When a horse is hollow in the back and is compensated by using the shoulders or using the quarters more, the, the movement is edgy and it feels big. So you get thrown up in the air and then the back drops and you get left in the air. And of course you come down again as the horse's back is on its way up. So when a horse can work in this outline, the bit that you're sitting on is at the top of the movement. So you're really not moving. Everything else is moving around you. Okay, next slide, please. So another exercise that I use, which I find invaluable is turn on the forehand. So turn on the forehand is a very, very um, interesting um, exercise because it engages many parts of the horse's body. And the beautiful thing about it is it's static so that the horse doesn't have to have any impulsion and doesn't need to um, put a lot of effort into gaining range of motion, mobility and alteration in posture. Um, what we do, uh, sorry, it is the, um, the, let me see, it is a yoga movement in essence. If we have the next slide, please. So this is a yoga half split. So it involves bringing one leg under the central mass, thus helping the pelvis to rotate underneath in where we need it to be. Um, and then the horse to transfer the weight from the outside hind to the inside hind as the inside hind crosses in front of the outside hind, creates enough lateral movement to alter the pitch and yaw of the pelvis in motion. But again, being a static exercise, if the horse has a bad back, they can still invest themselves enough to make an alteration of, of, of their posture. Um, next slide, please. And it is one of the best exercises for the abdominal wall. It is essentially a crunch exercise. And so if the horse has dropped out through the abdomen because of the hollow back, um, the, the half split, the turn about the forehand, tones, strengthens and shortens all the abdominal muscles and thrusts the spine upwards under the rider. It's invaluable. It takes quite a while for them to get good at it, but the better the horse does turn about the forehand, the better they ride and the more range of motion and strength they'll have through the, the central torso. Um, next, exor uh, next exercise, next slide. Okay, so turn about the forehand, we want the horse rotating around the inside four, uh, marking time. So we don't want the front end to drift at all. If the front end drifts while the back end is moving, you don't get that lift through the back. You don't get that upward thrust that the inside hind coming through under the body causes. So how it's done is more important than the exercise itself. The devil is in the detail. So we're asking the, um, the quarters to rotate around the inside four, which remains static and crossing inside hind in front of outside hind in a uniform and regular way. When they get good at this, they go around like a Swiss clock. And so that's the goal. I think we have some video for you next. So uh, next slide. What I find is um, creating a 40 to 45 degree angle in the uh, neck uh, prior to doing turnabout forehand sets the spinal column up for the crossing. So if you do do this exercise, make sure that you hold the um, deflection at 40 to 45 degrees. Now, the best way to do this is to shorten the inside rein before you even start. So we, we come to a halt, shorten the inside rein and bring both your hands together because the inside uh, flexion needs to be set, set in a way that you're holding the contact with the inside rein and you're neither giving nor taking, you're setting it like a, a, a side rein. So that when the horse releases through the thorax and starts to create a, a, a flexion under the saddle, they can release the inside rein to your hand. If you're pulling, they'll never release it. If it's not there, you'll lose the flexion. And then of course you lose the turn about the forehand because they'll no longer cross 
they'll drift out of the shoulder or walk backwards. So neck flexion, just as in the uh, Giravolta lunge exercise, is absolutely critical. And it's the, the, the one which I find people don't do the most because it's quite hard to get right, but if you must have it. The flexion in the head and neck is crucial. Okay, I think we have a video next. So here's a turn about the forehand. Okay, so when, they, when the horse gets good at it, I do three, four rotations, not straight away. I tend to get one, two, three steps and then gradually build the number of steps because it's a, an exercise of strengthening, coordination and range of motion. So they need to do a lot of it and they need, to, they need practice time, just like anyone learning anything. If you're learning the piano, it's not about talent, it's about practice. You've got to put in the hours and the horse has to put in the hours in this exercise to be able to learn to coordinate and build the necessary musculature. And uh, of course, muscles take time. And if the horse has pain or muscles that are in spasm, they have to release. So it's a patient but repetitive uh, process. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So turn about the forehand, that la the, 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 the video you saw is with the head in a, a sort of classical outline, if you like. When the horse gets very, very supple, um, it can be made even harder or harder for the horse to do, but obviously more impactful from a core point of view by doing it in, forward, down and out. So um, we do turn about the forehand with the horse in a grazing position. There is nothing like this exercise because as the inside hind comes under, and the abdominals tighten, the back rounds. If the horse is already completely released along the top line and has a 40 degree inside flexion, it is a complete workout for the torso. It solves many, many issues that relate to kissing spine or at least cause kissing spine in one exercise. Very, very good to do. I think we have a video of that next. Now it looks Western, but it isn't a spin. I know that the Western horses do spin. Because the horse is rotating around the inside four, this is a back end lumbar exercise. Because um, as you can see, as the horse goes round, the pelvis has to tilt, the inside hand has to engage. And for the pelvis to roll left to right, they have to release in the lumbar area behind the saddle and allow the lumbar vertebra to rotate in relation to each other. So you get this rotation and rounding behind the saddle. This in turn thrusts upwards in the thoracic area, realigning the spine to where it should be if it's slightly dipped. So a very, very powerful exercise. Um, okay, next slide, please. So in very basic terms, because it's a system, because it's a mechanism, we need the, the horse's body to work as an orchestra. So different instruments, but all playing the same piece of music. If we can achieve these things, get the pelvic angle right and get the back up, the horse can therefore sit, lightens the front end and frees the head and neck and the horse is pain-free, mobile and athletic. So that is our goal. And I just want you to see a video of one of my favorite horses. Next uh, slide, please. This is an Arab stallion, had the good fortune not to be ridden, but uh, he displays what we all need to be aiming at with our horses. And it doesn't have to be an Arab stallion, but if you look at how he moves, he lowers his head forward to lift up through the back. And this gives him excellent balance, range of motion, expression, and he's a free mover because everything's in the right place and everything's working as it should be. So hold that image or, or this, this video in your mind about how you want your horse to be balanced when they're moving. And this will help you recognize it when you get glimmers out of a horse that's compromised into a horse that is strong and moving properly. Thank you, next slide, please. So, it, for those of you who, who have my book, these two exercises are in the book, 
But obviously, if you're performing a rehabilitation on a horse that has is physically compromised, you have to take more time, do it in smaller steps, little chunks, and also help them with uh, medication and other therapies, good physiotherapy, a good veterinary practice to follow up on what you're doing. And um, take the exercises and work them to the point where you have, uh, you're, you're trying to turn the horse from a horse that can't into a horse that can. So the trick is to use, say, those two exercises and others in the book, but be more thorough and understanding that the horse can't necessarily deliver in the beginning and you're working your way there incrementally. Lovely. Thank you. Great stuff. Sorry, it's a bit slow with the older uh, microphone there. Thank you, Simon. Um, fascinating as ever. Um, we've got lots of questions. Um, we'll do our best to maybe group some similar ones together and just get through a few. We're, we're, we're probably going to crack on till about nine o'clock, so everybody. So hopefully that will help us get through at least a few of these questions. So shall I kick off? Um, Right, Simon, uh, this is from Tracy. Um, my mare is 12 with kissing spines in T12 and T13. I've done lots of rehab with her. I really want to know if I don't ride her anymore and keep her strong and conditioned, is this better than having her have a surgical intervention to fix the kissing spines in the hope of riding her again? What's actually best for my mare? And there's a couple of other questions as, for the people as well asking about surgical intervention. So maybe we could sort of group those together yeah you know this is a tough one because of course we love our horses and we don't want them to suffer do you know i would say that if you feel that you have um given the rehabilitation your best shot and seen improvements but you really don't feel that you've got all the way when when this happens, you can always go to the fallback position and talk to your vet about medication. Because if there are areas where there are still compression points that, that, that may cause the horse chronic pain, it's not unheard of, in fact, it's quite common to have, say, ultrasound guided corticosteroid injections at the inflammation sites, at the contact point sites, so they don't hurt the horse anymore. They tend to last eight to 12 weeks, so it's not that frequent, four times a year, very precisely where these points are, and you could still have a very good riding horse that isn't suffering. So I, I, that would be my go-to before considering retirement. Great. Because I think that, you know, we know horses, and although they're happy sort of mooching around the field for the next sort of 10, 15 years, they do go a bit wild and I think they do enjoy the interaction with us. And it, as long as we're sensible about it and we use medication to, uh, as a sort of maintenance when there's nothing else we can do, that might, might be preferable over surgical intervention. Because I see a lot of horses that have, have had surgery and they still need rehab and they still may, maybe need medication to help them. I think this might Again, be, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I think this might link actually to something that Tracy Stevens has put. So her mare is 12 with kitting spines in T12 and T13. That's the one I've asked. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Brain. Not, yeah. brain. <laughs> yeah, brain. Sorry, beg your pardon. As it was still there. So I, I, sorry, I, I, got I was looking at others. It's, yeah, sorry. Um, okay. There's another one about um, uh, of an ex flat racehorse. So T11 to L1 are fused. Um, he's got very limited lateral bend. He's age six, retired at three. How can I separate them if they're fused or should I concentrate on the supporting muscles? That's a tricky one. That's true. I would say that if they're few, if all of those are fused, that is a, a surgery candidate. Because you cannot engage the muscles if there's no flexibility in the spine and if they're fused, that part of the spine will it'll never move again. So that's a tricky one. And I would say that that's, that's a candidate for surgical intervention because there's no other way, either that or retirement. 
Thank you. That's a, yeah, good luck. <laughs> um, should you stop normal schooling whilst doing the core conditioning? E.g., does normal schooling techniques interfere with your core process? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, the thing is, if, if you have a horse that is experiencing discomfort, they will not offer you responses to your aids because they will anticipate moving in a particular way as hurting. So yes, I tend to, if I'm doing this with a horse, I will do only this because riding normally and schooling is just going to make the horse more uncomfortable. And you know, what I've found is that, you know, you can train and train and train and train and train. Um, and if the horse isn't steadily improving, there's usually a reason. And if you go back and you solve that problem, what I find quite interesting is that very shortly afterwards, all those things that you were trying to train your horse to do unsuccessfully, they suddenly offer. So they were taking it on. They were taking it on. They were trying all along. They were trying to produce leg yield shoulder in half pass or whatever you're trying to do. And the reason it was pitiful is because they, they were self-limiting their, their own movement to prevent it from hurting. So, yeah, no, normal schooling is probably off the cards if you're rehabbing because you need to limit the discomfort and maximize proactively the postural correction. The other aspect is horses regress very, very quickly. You know, if they've had an existing problem, if they've had a back problem in the past, you can, you can do an excellent rehab. But if you put a bad saddle on for a month, they go backwards quicker than they did in the first place. So I think that we have to be very sensitive to the sort of reactive nature that we have and horses uh, to pain and discomfort. And, you know, if, if it's even possible that it's going to hurt, medicate and treat the area with good rehabilitation and then and then you can school and compete and do all the other things when the horse physically can because if they physically can't or think it's going to hurt it's not really fair there's um a couple actually because schooling is is of course not just ridden and there are a couple of questions about um your exercises in hand so do you claire do you start these exercises in hand or under saddle and there was one somewhere else which I can't find now because there's so many brilliant questions, but I'll find it in a minute. So if you could talk about in hand work, that'd be great, Simon. I think it depends on the um, on the extent of the horse's problems. If they are in a bad way or they're post op, I I, I I do actually do some turn about the forehand, a bit of leg yield, shoulder in in hand, just to get the ball rolling in walk. But you're, you're fairly limited with lateral exercises in hand because you can't control the outside of the body. Even if you're long lining and you've got an outside rein contact, there's too much mass. So I do prefer to use either the lunge if the horse cannot be ridden or lunge prior to the ridden exercises if you're at that point in rehab. Um, so yes, there's a value of, of in hand exercises. But I think the important thing to remember is that, that there's only one force which is strong enough to affect such a large structure like the horse's spine and the musculature in the torso. And that's within the horse itself. There's nothing you can do from the exterior of the horse to push the spine upwards. So it really is a case of isolating the core musculature so they start to perform their job and correct the discrepancy that is causing the degenerative uh, posture. And I have found that the lunge work is the only in-hand work that you can generate sufficient energy within the horse's body to affect posture. The rest of it seems to be mediocre. But as I said, it's not bad to get the ball rolling particularly if they've had a bit of a bad time, you know, they need to sort of desensitize. A little bit of in-hand work does allow you to build a little bit of trust before you get into the rehabilitation phase, which 
you know, I think it's important to recognize, you know, when you see on the TV, and I hope none of you have experienced it, but when you do see people that have had a nasty uh, accident and they've got to relearn how to walk, they are sweating. Rehab is hard. You know, it, it really is hard. I mean, it's hard for the individual. It's hard for the, the therapist. But at the end of it, you know, it's all possible. Um, so we do have to strategize and plan a soft approach, certainly initially, that gradually builds in intensity to try and take on board the fact that, that they're suffering. And we have to train them really at the upper limit of their comfort zone. Otherwise, they're not going to progress. I think that helps with, so Julie said, I'm not riding my former racehorse yet, but do lots of groundwork. Can these be done, these exercises be done successfully in hand? So I think that helps with that one. Sally asked, is it all written in the book or are there in hand exercises in the book too? The only in, the only in hand exercise in the book is the Giro Volta, the lunging exercise. Yeah, and actually, uh, the, we're going to in because Francis asked about the Giro Volta. So, what kind of equipment do you use to lunge and create that inside bend? A lunge caverson makes this very difficult. Where does one attach the line to the bit? Yeah, that's a good question. I always use a former bit, uh, you know, with the, the needles either side so it can't pull through. Because, again, you've got to remember with a horse that's weighing 600 kilos that is falling to the outside, um, they're just going to take you with them or the bit's going to pull through the mouth there are there's a lot of force involved horses are extremely sensitive but also they're more than capable of taking anything a human being can apply as long as it's not jerky so we have to apply a certain amount of force to create that inside flexion so to create a shoulder in body angle on the lunge you have to be quite manual with the, the lunge line initially, because of course they're stiff and they're falling. So you have to take that contact and really brace against it in the first week or two, because they are going to force against it. So, so having a, um, a former bit will stop the bit from coming through the mouth, very useful. But also we have to point the lunge whip at the rib cage where the leg will eventually be. And that of course will tie in the ridden work to the lunge work because the point of focus that the horse has to flex or learn to flex through the thorax will be where the leg is. So we point the whip there and the horse must remain on the outside of that lunge whip. Because if they fall in and don't flex through the thorax, we are not inducing a, a repair, a restoration of what should, it should be. So yes, the interaction between the lunge line and the whip is very specific to create that shoulder and body angle on the lunge. Right. And somebody else asked about equipment as well and saying um, about whether they should be using side reins or need to use side reins. So I guess you, you kind of answered that one already. Yeah, but uh, that is a good question. OK, so there's a lot of apparatus out there, you know, that we're not short of gear with horses. And, I, I, you know, I have to try, I say I've tried all of it. I think I've tried all of it. Um, I come to the conclusion that anything that restrains the spinal column, anything that shortens the distance between the nose and the tail encourages the tense area to remain tense. The, the only way I've found to successfully decompress the spine and separate the processes is a full elongation from ears to tail. So anything that you concertina the neck with will, as you bring the head back, the back hollows. So the head has to be free, has to be forward, out and down, and it has to release on its own. So no, I don't use any restrictive equipment, no ropes, no elastics, no chambon, no pessoa, no side reins, because they just get in the way of stretching. And you've got to remember, you know, we, we, again, we have to take on board the fact that this is, a, this is an animal that doesn't understand. I mean, they're, they're emotionally very intelligent, but they don't have any logic. They don't know where the pain is coming from. They don't know why it's there. They, they associate it with certain things that they do, which is why they anticipate and defend themselves and react. Um, so we have to make it as easy as possible for them and show them the direction. We have to let them win. And yeah, any compression, um, they will lean on it. 
or tense up as a result of the fact that they are just being compressed once again. I think that, that links in and um, helps answer Mitzi's question. She wondered if you used a gadget. How do you encourage to get the horse's head as low as in that Giravolta video? Yeah, it's a good question. You see, the, the, the beauty of this is because we're, we're obeying the rules of physics as they relate to the horse's biology, means that when you create the um, shoulder in angle, and Deliger and Ier wrote a whole book on shoulder in um, because it is perfect alignment. If you think that the horse would be straight, it would be perfectly aligned, but they end up being crooked. The inside flexion of shoulder in actually creates perfect alignment. At least it teaches the horse how to align perfectly on a curve of the spine. Um, so when we create this uh, shoulder in on a lunge circle, it aligns the spine optimally between the shoulder blades in front of the pelvis, the head and neck uh, drop into a groove, a groove made by the thoracic sling, a little bit like a zip. So if you have a zip that runs off track, that's what's happening really with your horse's spine when they're crooked. So the shoulder and angle aligns it perfectly. And the next thing that happens is the head and neck stretch out the front. The horse does it voluntarily because it just feels better to do this. So we're not really creating anything. We're just opening the door for the horse and they do it themselves. So there's no way that you can get a horse to stretch their head out. They have to do it voluntarily. And if we create the right criteria, the right angles, they do. Great, thank you. And then uh, we've got time for one more. I think this is a, it's a good one because it's, a, it's about the, the process and how you, how you go about it. Um, so Jackie asks, when starting rehab post-surgery, is it better to have a slower trot and not tracking up behind with head low than moving forward and tracking up but head not so low? Because we see Wallace is really tracking up in that video, but obviously he's very experienced and practised. Yeah. Yeah, I really should have got a video of a horse that's compromised to show you the difference. All right, what's very important here, if you have a bad back, any energy, any impulsion, any, any, any motion, it, it's just the very, very opposite of what you want to do. So if you're after performance and you have a horse that's in perfect physical condition, yes, you want engagement, impulsion, straightness, you want all these things. You need energy. It needs to be working. If you're trying to isolate a compromised and painful body part, you do not want these things. Tracking up is, is, is not desirable at all. You want to keep the movement minimal, but the area that you're trying to activate very narrowly um targeted so forget things like um energy forget things like tracking up forget engagement you're trying to fix the horse all those things you can bring in later but the more uh the more forward you try and get the horse if they've got a bad back the more they're going to lock up the more they're going to resent it it's a very negative experience for them and it doesn't work because you're trying to get the horse to a position where they relax enough to let go. And that's going to be initially in a very, very slow trot. Just like, again, just like somebody that's learning to walk again after a nasty accident, you need all these muscles to gradually develop and nerves and soft tissue to relax, to become less inflamed. And, you know, very important to bear in mind, that if you've got a horse that has been not working properly for a long time, they're going to be strong in places where you don't want them strong and they'll be weak in places where you need them strong. So um, the body is not going to be in a balanced configuration. It's going to be, uh, again, strong where it's been compensating and the muscles will be atrophied in areas that have never been used. So we have to take that into account. And that process needs soft, gentle work but at the right angles. And then gradually as things improve, then you can start adding power and adding engagement. And then of course the paces will come through and the horse will be better balanced. So yes, don't worry about tracking up. Don't worry about impulsion. Just as long as they've got enough energy to keep the trot moving, this is perfect. Great, wonderful, Simon. 
I think we, we're going to have to just move on to finishing up because we've got, we've had so many questions. We had a record number of questions tonight, in fact, and we're just we're never going to get through them all. So um, let's just um, give people some info about where they can find you and find out more and so on um, and just draw tonight to a close. But then hopefully you'll be back. I think we're back anyway in March and we haven't decided what the topic is. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. So um, hopefully everyone can just see the screen. Just a quick one about what's coming up and then we'll pop up where you can find Simon and some of the other exciting things that he's doing at the moment. Um, so just for those who uh, want to come our gold members or want to come back, uh, we've got Tracy Cole next week, who's a um, fabulous um, person for helping with confidence problems. Her background is NLP um, and she's a great equestrian who, who can just help everyday people with their, their confidence problems. Um, fabulous Andrew McLean is coming back um, to talk about, well, answer the question, naughty horses or are they? Um, and really look at what causes particular behaviour in horses. Um, fabulous Claire Myers is coming to help us understand how we can help our bodies be more effective when we're riding the horses. So well, how can we use Pilates to help us improve our riding, which hopefully will also help improve the, the horses. Um, and then Jason Webb on the 24th of Feb is coming to talk to us about setting the, your horse out and about. So if you go somewhere else for a hack or if you go to a competition or a fun ride, how can you get over those jittery nerves at the beginning? Now, back to the important bit, Simon. Um, this is how people can find you. Um, any more to add? Yes. So uh, anyone struggling with kissing spine, um, we do offer one-to-one -one coaching at a yard in Wiltshire. Um, you can best get through to us through our Facebook page called Conditioning for Horses. That's the one. And also because we realize that um, it's not so easy to travel great distances, particularly if you're in Kentucky, getting to Wiltshire is quite tricky. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is we're currently uh, putting together and filming a how-to video series, how to undertake this rehabilitation for kissing spine yourself step by step so if you keep an eye on our core conditioning for horses facebook page as soon as we're done filming and editing it should be up there and then you can you can buy it and it should well the, the, our goal is to help you go through every step with all the things that you need to know to do the rehabilitation yourself what not to do and what to do when problems occur. But this is the system that we use. So look out for that on our Facebook page. Brilliant, thank you. And good and you luck. Are, if you are a bit closer than Kentucky, you do take horses in as well for rehab, don't you, at your yard? We do take a few. You, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I've just got, there was a lovely comment from Lara on the on the question. So I just thought I'd read that out, out as well. She said, um, feedback rather than a question. But having had a lesson with you Saturday, where my horse really struggled doing the figure of eight, he can now do, um, he can now do it after just one session. And my physio can't believe that his shape started to change already. Yay. Wonderful, wonderful. That's <laughs> great news. Wow. Yeah, you know that's interesting. If you if you get if you get it just right, you get progress very very quickly. That's, that's, that's the beauty of helping horses move better. Um, and it's very fulfilling. Well, I'm, Lara, well done. I look forward to seeing you soon. Great stuff. Um, thank you, Simon. And we'll obviously we'll publicize when your videos are coming out as well through, um, through Horse Tribe. Um, and you're gonna be with us at Horse Fest as well in July. So we're gonna- I look forward to it. Well. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. We've uh, we've had a fabulous evening. Um, hope everybody else has too. Um, if people have got time, if you could just quickly answer the questionnaire when you go out of the webinar, come straight up on your screen. If you could just give us some feedback and also tell us anything else you'd like to learn about, that'd be amazing. Um, all this is, is just to say thank you very much, Simon. Yeah. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you both and thank you everyone and best of luck to you all. And uh, please keep looking at Horse Tribe's uh, work they're leading the way. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and a privilege. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's been uh, like you. Thank you. And thank you for all your questions. We're sorry we didn't get to answer them all tonight, but they were amazing. And we wish you the best of luck with your horses. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, take care. Bye. 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 -bye.